am happy to be here today. We have a meeting of the minds here today to talk about the worldwide movement that has occurred because of um, the senseless killing of George Floyd. And we have a voice. I want to hear your voice. The world wants to hear your voice um, about what's going on and what can we do as educators, as educational people to help our children in the school system. And what can we do? How can we make a difference? Um, you know, for our children of our future. Because if we can reach our children, hopefully that can also promote change and not continue to perpetuate these stereotypes. So before we get started, and I know you all have a lot to say, I want you all to introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Cherkwani Therese. Feel free to call me TQ um, or Reese, whichever you like. I have been teaching, man, this is my 10th year in the classroom. Praise Jesus. <laughs> um, and um, first I taught math. Now I teach English. So I'm back to teaching English. Um, I started off as a parent educator. And when I moved to Texas, I uh, did apply for my certification and have been working in um, Texas public schools ever since I started off in the uh, charter school system and I moved back over to the public side. So, but mm. happy to be here. So my name is Morgan Latin and I, uh, after I served in education for about six years, okay. I started as a college counselor um, at a high school in San Antonio. I taught for a year in Mississippi, rural Mississippi. Ooh. Um, and I was self-contained with sixth graders, all subjects. Um, that was wow. an interesting year. And then um, I came back to Houston and I taught at a charter school in Sunnyside for four years. I taught seventh grade and mostly eighth grade. Um, and my, actually my first kids that I had at Sunnyside just graduated this year, which was exciting. Um, and now I'm actually, I left the classroom and I'm now in law school. My name is Jasmine. Um, I have been in education going on, well, teaching on record eight years now. But um, a sub, uh, prior to that, um, just hitting middle school where I feel like uh, our students, are needed the most. They need someone there for them the most. Um, so I'm in love with middle school. I don't know why, but I do. I love my middle schoolers. Prior to that, I had worked in Aldine ISD as a sub in an elementary, um, just a, in between middle school, Hamrick Middle School and Escamilla Intermediate. Okay. Wow. And honey, I did a few, a few months at Bailey. So I got, um, I was at Bailey last year just for maybe two months. I took someone's place and then I uh, kind of followed up. Uh, yes. <laughs> I remember. I remember because when y'all, um, that was the year I left eighth grade. I needed a break. So I went down to sixth grade. I needed a break. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then we have Miss Sanders on I worked with Ms. Sanders. Um, I started my career with her, and I followed her for four years. Yes. Hello, hello, everyone. How are you doing? Hey, my name is Tanya Sanders. I've been in education now for 23 years, Ooh. all pretty much inner city youth uh, kids. Um, and I, it's funny, I always pray to God, give me the cases that people don't want. And mm -hmm. let me see what we, we can do with them. And I tell anybody, if you give me an opportunity, I can train you to be the best teacher walking. But you got to have the passion. You got to have the zeal. Mm -hmm. You got to want to see our kids excel. And I went into this with the whole belief that what I make happen for others, the children of others, and it didn't matter to me what color. It was just the children of others that I was afforded the opportunity to work with. What I what I make happen for them, God will make happen for my own. And you know, I only have one daughter and she's been a tremendous blessing and she's been tremendously blessed in people giving into her life as I give into the lives of 
other. So uh, that's pretty much me. And uh, Joy may have shared, I mean, we work with, um, from uh, DAEP students, uh, students that have been kicked out of their mm -hmm. uh, home schools. We've uh, worked with residential treatment centers, children, uh, worked with, again, inner city, Houston Independent School District uh, kids um, who had been failing in some of the schools failing horribly before going in and, and nine times out of 10, it's, it's our kids, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, just uh, was blessed to be able to transform several HISD and its spring with turnaround school situations. So that's wow. pretty much me. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, I kind of want to, I start, I talked about it a little bit. Um, uh, a friend of mine, she had an experience, a white friend had an experience with another white person. I told my friend, you have to say something to this lady. She said some uh, posted something on social media that was kind of racially motivated. And I was like, you have a responsibility to check this person. And she has a mixed daughter at home. So you have to set the example for your daughter as well. And mm -hmm. she got in trouble by her principal. She was reprimanded, but her response to the privileged person was educational. She served her with facts and that she gave her a quote from um, Al Sharpton. So she didn't even put too much of her subjective opinion in the response, but she was reprimanded by her principal. So as educators, have you noticed like any unfair treatment um, of students or teachers or something that you witnessed in the school system? That's an interesting question because I've seen some some very different things being in education and I've worked um, in schools that were probably minority or not so much. And um, I guess what I've seen more of than anything else is a little bit more favoritism at times mm. um, towards certain teachers where they're able to get away with a little bit more or um, give them a little bit more expression than others. I think overall, this really depends on the administrator um, because that administrator drives the message of the school and uh, what they want to say and like how much expression you're allowed to have. Um, and so if your administrator is a little bit more liberal to allow you to express yourself creat creatively, um, then you can speak more freely. But oftentimes, um, I think that's not the case. But then do you think that there are administrators who then perpetuate um, the problems that we're having today with our children? Because I think the administrator in telling her to be quiet and don't speak up in an educational way, um, I think she's part of the problem. I believe that people bring their own value systems into mm -hmm. the workplace. And um, depending on what your value systems are, mm -hmm. like between how you manage people, how you think people should be managed, um, and how you think that people should respond to your authority, so to speak, or your extreme authority, if you are the uh, principal in charge of a school, something like that, of that nature. Um, I think that is ultimately determining how open you are to hearing other people's voices, because there's a lot of people who um, believe, well, I'm the head leader of the school, and so what I say goes. You may not agree with it, but I don't want to hear your disagreement. There's some of that, right? So some people just want, um, for lack of a better word, I want to be surrounded by yes men. Um, and then there's other leaders who will make the final decision, but are still open to hearing voices that are different or have a different opinion, um, mm -hmm. or maybe even opposed to the decision, but they're still going to hold firm with what they said, but at least they're willing to hear you out. So I think it kind of all depends on the administrator. Um, and depending on which type you have, I think that sets the tone and allows you either to speak freely or not be able to speak at all. Actually, um, I'll agree with that. Um, so every year that I taught, I taught in predominantly black schools mm -hmm. and only once did I have um, a white principal. Every, everywhere else, I feel like majority of the staff and everything were also 
black. Um, and I'll say that I had two principles that I felt like really fell into that category of wanting a whole bunch of just wanting people to be yes men and not really wanting to hear um, other opinions. Um, and so I think that it, that really did play a large role uh, for me as far as the type of leader that that person was. I say that because at first I was like, maybe it was just the fact that the first principal I had was a white woman. And oftentimes she felt very, um, she seems to feel threatened, um, mm. her position threatened on a campus where parents would come for her um, and things like that. It seemed as if she always felt the need to kind of um, make her presence known um, mm. on campus and so sometimes it was her asserting her authority even when it may not have really been warranted um, and so I, at first I was like well maybe maybe it was just her feeling threatened in that position but then I feel like year of people experience even with a black female principal um, but it was the same type of leadership style as far as feeling like your authority was where everyone was agreeing with you and saying yes, instead of being willing to hear different perspectives. Um, and I'll say in both situations, you could see how it affected interactions with students, what teachers felt like they could get away with mm -hmm. um, and everything else that you're like, are we here for the kids or, you know, are we here to just protect our authority and our power? I agree with both of uh, what has been said um, about the principles and things like that. And I feel like as a teacher, sometimes knowing that some lines are going to be crossed, you have to push back. Um, you have to push back and let them know to set your grounds because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's about building those relationships. And like me working uh at for the school I work for like we have yet to do any type of celebration or any type of cultural and I feel that now it's for teachers to take that stand along with teaching the kids the proper way of doing it to build that culture and because the principals I'm learning they're gonna do the yes part of what the district is telling them to do wow um and it's just like some principles of becoming close they're torn uh because they want to push but then in the back of their mind is i have to keep my job so i'm telling y'all to stri uh, strictly what's by the book uh i may not agree but i'm gonna be by the book because i do have to keep my job i do have to stand my ground on that so it's I'm learning it's a give or take with them and I feel like as a teacher a teacher leader that it's now time for us to okay you got to do by the book we got to do by the book also but we got to push and we got to push more cultural and things and set in stone for our kids and have that type of tone with our kids of what they see every day and also teaching them the proper way, okay? These are things that y'all gonna have to change because you are the future, if that makes sense. Because the APs and the principal are gonna be by the book. It's coming by the, uh, from the district and the district is coming from the board. Have any U.S. educators, have you experienced or witnessed whether well, you didn't experience personally um, racism, by a teacher to another student, regardless of a co color, or have you experienced it yourself, unfair treatment um, because of the color of your skin? I guess I'll go first. I have. <laughs> um, by a certain teacher, um, it's just still on our campus, and then I also seen it with our youth, um, the minorities, like they're always being put out, they always, and then they have to go try to vent it out. But the way it came across me is I started off as a sixth grade teacher. And this one particular teacher, she was in eighth grade and she taught math. 
but she could never gain control. At one point, they even came and got me out of sixth grade, who was a strong teacher, to go sit in her classroom. And I'm and I was in disbelief. And then the following year, they was gonna they was making changes. So she and it got back to me that she basically came out and said since she knew that they was gonna switch her out of math uh to science that oh she just wanted to be with her black sisters and things like that till this day me and this teacher do not see eye to eye and i even pointed out to her i was like try to be the polite way of it that you don't relate to the kids you hold yourself to this high standard and they see you as an older white lady and you brag about how much money and what you have and that is not the kids we teach but also some of our kids, um, they're kids of color. Mm-hmm. So you can't go in and you can't talk, but if you can disrespect me as your colleague who have never done anything to you, that's just your culture. That is just not your culture. I'm sorry. That's your character. Mm. And you see me beneath you and we on the same playing level. Wow. I'm sorry to hear that. So has this situation or anything been taken to the administration? Um, it was, but it was almost like told to just take the bigger hand in it because she went in there crying and wanted to make herself to have sympathy for her. I just basically told them that, hey, she could apologize to you guys just don't ever, ever put me on the same team with her and listen to those students because they are being truthful of what they're saying. They're not just hating her because they think she can't teach or whatever. It is things that's been said out of her mouth. And here recently, um, we had another situation on our campus where um, another teacher of a white young, like white lady, she basically almost just called a group of black kids the n-word no way so was there a consequence for that um in that case it was because parents got involved and the kids um listening to just teachers that they went and been to is for them to take a stand and then for their for their parents to take the upper hand she has been let go okay okay but it's like, Miss Reese, did you have anything to add? Because I saw you make a face when we, oh, Miss Sanders is back. <laughs> I saw you make a face. When... Um, well, as a student, um, I had a couple of experiences. I went to several different high schools. I came from very humble beginnings, low income family, public aid, all of that. And um, what I noticed. I remember I had this one particular conversation with one of my teachers who did have to be white. And um, she said to me, she was just like, you know, Turquanitra, you're so intelligent. I'm just so surprised about how intelligent you are given your situation. And as a child, I didn't understand what that meant, you know? Um, And then later in high school, I had a guidance counselor who um, I went to go visit. So just a little backstory. I went to three different high schools. My parents moved around a lot. When I tell you that the Lord himself put his hand upon my life, he definitely did. Because I wasn't supposed to be here, right? He really put people in my life, mentors in my life, to lead me down the right path. And um, I, so I'm at an all-white school in an upper echelon environment. Now I'm in the suburbs, went from the inner city into the suburbs and went to visit my guidance counselor. And I said, hey, um, I'm looking to graduate early. I have this many, this amount of credits and I want to go to this college, blah, blah, blah. And he turns and looks at me and he says, you cannot graduate early. And even if you did graduate early, I would recommend that you would go to community college and not go to college. Wow. And I looked at him and for a second there I was taken back. So so I asked him to explain why he felt like I couldn't graduate early. There was a discrepancy in my transcripts. And he wasn't even willing to investigate the fact that I was saying that no, this is wrong. 
I did take these classes. I have the proof that I took these classes. He's saying he needed it from the other school. He didn't even want to investigate. Instead, he just wanted me to stay an extra year to become a super senior. And I wasn't having that. So we got into a full-blown shouting match, for lack of a better word, in his office. And then he finally called the other school. They confirmed what I said. You think the man apologized? No. Wow. Um, and I told my father about the conversation. And he said, no, you're going to college. He said, you know, given your background, if you stay here with your mom, you go to community college, that's not going to be a good environment for you. You're going to college. So December came. I graduated early, and I went to Western Illinois University. And, you wow. know, your counselor has to sign your um, permission to graduate or whatever. So I handed him my form, and he looks at me. He said, mm, signed it. He's like, well, it's been a pleasure. I said, well, it ain't been a pleasure on mine, and I walked out. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I mean, that saddens me. So this brings me to the point. If we do have um, teachers in the school system who don't believe in our black and brown children and then they treat them the way you were treated how do we combat that how do i don't know what to do with that because that's something that's sometimes not out in the open so is there how do we help that situation to afford those same opportunities that we give our white students you know if you were you know, have those underlining racial feelings to this to the black children and give them the same opportunities and that same encouragement. What do we do? I think people have to be willing to listen mm -hmm. um, and value black experiences and black voices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I've worked in a lot of places where leadership, like my on campus, was predominantly black but like district and upper leadership is still all white. Um, and what I saw with the charter school network that I worked for is that we were seeing success with our Hispanic students, but our black students still were not getting to the same level of success. And I think a lot of times what needs to happen is people need to understand and listen to the perspectives of black educators. A lot of times me having success with my students, I would have the highest scores in my school. And, um, and a lot of times it would be very competitive with a lot of other schools in the district. But it was because even though there was a lot of strict guidelines that they were starting to put on us, I mean, cur curriculum was almost to the point where it was scripted. Wow. But yet I found ways to infuse culture into my classroom I found ways to make sure that my students felt safe, that I built great relationships. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, what had my students work and get to a place where I had students passing star that had never passed star. Mm -hmm. And that was because I built a safe space mm -hmm. where my kids didn't have to feel like they were in survival mode. Right. They right. knew that I, I was taking care of all of outside extra stuff and no matter what you're doing elsewhere in the school building when you enter my classroom it's a safe space where you can make mistakes where you can learn where you can be yourself um because even in that I, my educational experiences growing up were very similar uh, to tqs i went to a very very wealthy private school in houston that's like twenty thousand dollars a year to go to school there um, <laughs> And I was very much on financial aid and I appreciated every bit of my educational experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it afforded me opportunities and I grew up in the same neighborhoods as my students. So going back to teach in my neighborhood and seeing the ridiculous disparity in what students were able to have, it made me want to work hard for my students, but right. it's understanding that sometimes for in, in, in black schools, things sometimes need to look different. We have to have cultural events to not have homecoming or to not have um, pep rallies and spirit events. Like those are things that are important to our kids. They need to be able to have fun in school. And sometimes it can be so strict and so harsh and militaristic that they don't feel like they can breathe right and 
feel safe um, in a classroom. So I think people have to, it's, it's understanding that perspective and listening to, um, to teachers who are having success with students, even with difficult students, and valuing that, even if it may look different than what you see working at a white school or a Hispanic school or whatever. So how do we get more teachers and more students to feel safe and not to feel the way how TQ was attacked or, you know, treated by, what, what was it, your counselor or whatever? Yes, it was my um, junior slash senior year counselor. And um, it's interesting because I actually complained to one of my teachers who was also white that I didn't like him and explained why. And mm -hmm. the teacher looked at me and said, well, I'm going to go back and tell him what you did. And I was just wow. like, Wow. You know, like I had no allies in that environment. Um, now I know as a teacher, like I always tell my students, you know, like if nobody else is gonna fight for you, the teacher's is gonna fight for you. You know, I build that relationship with them, and I say, come to me if you have a problem, because if I know about it, I can fix it. If I don't know about it, I can do about it. Right. But if I hear about it after the fact, I can't. Help it. And I know, like for me, not having that ally. Um, in the classroom, mm -hmm. but have a mentor outside of the environment. Of the you can turn it. Um, you can turn it. I want you to have this conversation with the teachers. I want you to ask these questions, right? And taught me how to advocate for myself. That way, that the main that which I never had in my educational career. If that makes sense. And that's why when I got to college. You know, a semester later, I could have those hard questions, uh, conversations with my professor. But like, hey, look, I got a C in your class. I need a B. What do I need to do to get a B in your class? Um, can I come in for extra credit? Can we, do you have office hours? Like, I knew how to have those conversations because my mentor taught me how to have those conversations. And then also my father, who was also very pivotal in my educational career, was also always pushing me because he never accepted anything other than excellence because he knew that I was smart even though that sometimes I didn't feel smart because in the system where I grew up in, I, it just, I just didn't feel like I was intelligent, right? It wasn't until I got to college around some other like-minded people that I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I got this. Yeah, I can, I can do this. I, I can hold my own academically. But my father always pushed me because he always knew what was inside of me. Um, he was like, no, we're going to do this. You're going to keep, he's like, I did not raise a quitter. You're going to keep pressing until change happens. And because he always had that attitude, that has been instilled in me as an adult. And even now, I even hear myself communicating those messages to my students. Okay, hey, look, I know this is a hard time. Let's, let's talk about it. You can cry about it. All right, tomorrow we're going to move forward. We need to keep pressing. We need to get this because this is, this is your way out. This is your, your Once you get your education, can't nobody keep, take it from you, right? Knowledge is power. And those messages came from the people that mentored me, my, my father um, and other female mentors in my life. But sometimes when, when uh, students, they don't have those mentors outside of the classroom. Sometimes they're looking for, for that from their teachers because that's supposed to be a safe haven. Well, how do we combat uh, when we don't have, you know, teachers at the school to help these students, to push these students, what do we do to get to the next level? I, I, can I jump in? This is Tanya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's when it becomes extremely important in all those PLCs that we become the voice for our children. We have to stop sitting back. I was, and Joy, you can share on this. I was always the one, the whole community creates the team. I don't run the hall, you run the hall. If you're on the seventh grade hall, that's your hall. You on the high school hall, that's your hall. You run your hall. And then when we come together to meet and we talk about those students that are struggling, well, why are they struggling? What have you done to help them, to, you know, to get up? Have you reached out to a parent? Oh, you couldn't get a parent? Have you had time, you know, for them to come in at lunch to get extra assistance? We can't just keep allowing our children to fall by the wayside. And, you know, you know, I was raised by two 
very strong educators and they told us with God in the education, you are unstoppable. And we have to make our kids believe that. I like mm -hmm. the lady's comment a few minutes ago when she was saying, you know, we got to have the talent show. That's true. And we got to put our talents on display. That's true. Because we got to make our kids feel that what they have to offer is important to our community to inside the school as well as outside. That's how we bring parents in when we put their talents on display. Our kids are amazing, but they have not been told that for a very long time. And fortunately, I don't know how people may think, fortunately, unfortunately, my parents were educating in the schools at the time of integration. And they always would say, if we could get the same resources to teach mm. our children, we know how to teach our children and to love our children. We don't just push our children along. We educate them along, just like you did, Joy, when you would see a student who was two, three years behind. Yes, it's heartbreaking, but now what? You know, you would say, now what? What can I do? How can I move them forward? And we started researching for those uh, tools to help those kids be successful. You, he may have started at seventh grade reading on third grade level, but he may have ended seventh grade on the fifth or sixth grade level. You move that kid ahead. That's our job, to push them to make them believe, feel, and know there's somebody and they can't excel. What's gotta stop is when we hear as adults, I know, we've all, I know I've heard them, in those meetings, oh, well, over there, they just let them do whatever, you know, because I don't want the headache. No, then you shouldn't be here right. if you don't want the headache. Because our kids should not be seen as the headache just because, yes, they're going to yell out the things in the classroom. It's culture. You know, mm -hmm. you you got to learn how to deal with the cultures. And if you don't know how to deal with it, go teach somewhere else. There's mm -hmm. not school for you. And, I, you know... In my nice, very professional way, I'd make a few, uh, this is not the place for you. You don't fit. You got to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Because I need people that fit for our kids, that believe in them and can help them be successful. Sorry, I was ranting. Uh, <laughs> I know we I have think... someone else that just joined us. Hi, my name is Jim. I, I taught with TQ uh, last summer. I, I'm just here to listen and learn, so... Okay, okay. Sometimes it's about, you know, listening and learning. Um, how she was saying that sometimes, you know, like those, we know those people are going to be in the school system that mm -hmm. don't want our kids in there. And I feel like, okay, you don't want them. I'm that teacher. Give them to me. Because then I can show them how to rise above you, uh, rise above you. Um, and then like, like this learning online, I, I really like it too because it's now I can reach these kids really at their level, what they're doing because they are on the cell phones, they are on the social media. So, um, and I always tell my kids, y'all is not that you're not that snappy, but I'm gonna teach you how to be technology snappy at it. So, using your tool, your power at your hand to make that your reality power, your power, you taking that and going beyond. So I feel like there, there, there are teachers, a lot of teachers out there that when those kids get put out, come into my classroom. Yeah. Okay, pull out your lesson. I, must, I got my class going on, but sitting here and relearn some things that you may not be grasping because I know that you are behind or whatever. And it's not the point that sometimes I feel like those teachers, because you're talking over their head, bring it down to them. It's a lot yes. of people not trying to meet our kids where they're at they may not be behind some of them when you get to talking to them they just can't relate to that material that way they want us to present it so you as a teacher in that classroom you have to take that stand i'm going to present it the way you understand it and then sometimes you have to take that stuff back too and be like let me understand you and i feel like nobody's really trying to understand where our kids are coming from because yep. they're coming from some of them have at homes your parents are doctors and lawyers and everything else but you're still fighting something when in and then you know that kid they coming in you like i just need to take this baby shopping because you know their life is hard at home and they got real world 
there's nobody trying to meet them in and it's nobody forgiving them of their mistakes. That's how you got to where you were because somebody forgave you of your mistakes. So it's like you're saying, we can't take this problem and run for it, from it. We have to run toward it right. because they are leading and we have to meet them and make sure we understand them. And then once you do that, you got them in the classroom. They ready to learn. They ready to go back. Like they are ready to yep. go so much farther. Yep. And I feel like that is just all people are just missing. You don't want to understand. Right. You got to understand. Right. I had this conversation um, with TQ and I was really passionate about it. I am what you call a capturing kids heart type teacher. I teach with my heart. It's just, I, and I know Miss Sanders always gets on me when I say this. I talk about this all the time. I was like, she, she's going to get mad. I was like, I don't think I'm a good teacher. But, you know, I love my kids and I put my heart. And she said, don't you say that? That's what makes you a good teacher because you can teach content. You can teach someone to teach content. But you capturing that kid's heart, and once you do that, they'll do anything for you. But I feel as though a few schools, some schools, they're such in a rush to get to the lesson, get to the lesson, but you don't know who that child is. You haven't reached that child. You don't know anything about that child, but you're rushing to get to that teeth. Okay, the, the first week of school, oh, you're trying to teach a lesson, but who is that child? But once you capture that kid's heart and you take that time to get to know that kid and you build that relationship, a child will do anything for you. They'll bend over backwards for you. I know some phenomenal teachers, but those kids don't like that teacher. They don't want, they want to get kicked out of that class because that teacher didn't take that time to build that relationship with that student. And kids can feel that. So I ooh, that just burns my biscuits <laughs> right there. So I think it's the experience of taking the time to get to know that child, but also how, what do we do for the teachers who need that lesson, who need that, that, that understanding, how do we reach them? So I'm going to say, I think one tangible thing that we can do is implicit bias training. Um, and I think that's really good because regardless of who you are, we all have implicit biases. Um, and so I think that's very important because a lot of times people don't mm -hmm. even realize how their biases mm -hmm. are affecting situations. Exactly. And that's whether you're black, white, Asian, yes. uh, <laughs> male, exactly. female, whatever. Um, so I think things like that are very important. Also, one thing that, um, I did when I started teaching in Mississippi is we went on a bus tour we drove the bus route of our students. Uh, oh. So all the teachers got on the bus and we rode the bus wow. route of our students. So we were actually able to see their neighborhoods, see uh, some of the, wow. um, the homes and things that they were coming from. And especially being like in rural Mississippi, it was very eye opening. And I had some kids that didn't even have running water. Um, and so being able to understand that, you know, it gets you to actually see more of what your students are are going through and i think sometimes that can even help soften people's hearts mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing is i think really highlighting those teachers that teach from that place and that perspective uh, because when you highlight those teachers i feel like so often what we highlight is just test scores you know and mm -hmm. who got their lesson plans in on time mm -hmm. and i'm gonna be real i rarely ever had my lesson plans in on time <laughs> But I promise you, when you walked in my classroom, my kids was going to be learning. Uh, you know, like highlight those things and celebrate the teachers who are making kids feel special. Because um, I think the other thing that really guided me with all that was Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If kids' basic needs are not being met, mm -hmm. then you can put Shakespeare and To Kill a Mockingbird in front of them. But if I'm still trying to figure out whether or not I'm gonna have a place to sleep tonight or I'm hungry in your class because I got here late again and I missed breakfast. You know, like those are the things that we have to be real about. Like if you were really in that situation, how important would To Kill a Mockingbird be to you? 
Um, so understanding that, and I think those are some like actual things that we can do to, to help people get a better understanding. So, so how do I do that without calling somebody out and making a student feel bad or ma making a student feel awkward? How do I have that conversation to start with? One thing that I would do is I, I would just have like, I would open it up and let my students know from the beginning, like, you know, if there's ever a time when you, when you're hungry or, you know, you miss breakfast, Ms. Latin will always keep snacks in her classroom and things like that. Just, you know, tap me on, on my shoulder or write me a note, let me know that you're struggling with something. And then other times you start to get a read for your kids and you know when you need to just like, baby, what's going on today? <laughs> you're not yourself. Tell, like, you know, if you don't want to share, you can write it out. Uh, I'll read it, um, you know, just to get a better understanding of what's off about them instead of getting mad because they're not behaving in the way that you want or would expect. And I'd like to add, it begins with relationship, just like we've all been stating. Mm -hmm. And you, you're right, just like you said, from the beginning of the school year. And I, again, I was always in inner city uh, schools and I did let my kids know, hey, look, because uh, I had the kind of kids that uh, my kids would steal. And I would tell them, you don't have to steal from me. I'll give you anything I got in this room, but ask first. And they, they appreciated that. I didn't insult them because here's why. I told them, we, we came from the same boat. We were in the same ship together, this classroom, and we got to make it work. And I kept snacks. I would pull kids to the side and I said, hey, let me talk to you. You know, hey, what's going on? I see you, you know, you lay or with my kids. Hey, you coming here? You smelling kind of funny. We don't need to do this every day. You need to, you know, straighten all this out. But get that relationship where yeah. they feel I can trust you. If they see you care, just like Joe was saying, capturing their hearts, they'll give you their heads. If they see you, he's genuine. He's really wanting to see, you know, want to enter into my world and understand me. They appreciate that. They'll give you their heads. You'll have them from then on out mm -hmm. with everything. I definitely agree. I'd like to add a little bit um, with that as well. Um, and I know like for me, my personality is a tad bit direct. So I have to get people on the side. I got to catch you in the hallway uh, on my planning period. I need to go seek you out because sometimes it's a tad bit rough and it ain't that I don't care about you it's because I really love you and I'm very passionate about education and the subject matter that I teach. You know, when I taught math and that year I took over algebra, baby, I really had to like step back and pull some kids and because they, they had the whole I hate my teacher thing going because the last teacher had left the building and it was a lot happening. Because so I really had to work really hard to build relationships and be very intentional about the experiences that are created in my classroom and my interaction with my students. And I had to apologize and say, you know what, Miss Reese had an off day yesterday. I'm so sorry. I should not have said that. Blah, blah, blah. You know, apologize to my class admit when I don't understand or know something like I just had to really just be a little bit more open with myself and it made me a better teacher I feel like um so I would definitely recommend building those relationships just echoing what other people said and having those private conversations because mm -hmm. it's in the privacy and that one-on-one -on -one time that I think you really build connection with students and sometimes you get to know something more about the story that you did not know before and they open up to you and they begin to trust you a little bit more because they because you took the time out of your day to go find it. You know, my my kids are always so I'm gonna stalk you, I'm gonna find you in the building. So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna handle mm -hmm. this today. So. Uh I'm gonna piggyback off of what you just said. It's just um when you said at times when you apologize and things like that, I think oftentimes people don't want to apologize and I have noticed that when you do apologize and you meant your wrong and you let them know that you're human the kids gravitate that towards you too because they already I had to learn my first couple years um just even just subbing they think you think you high and mighty but in reality at the end of the day no sweetheart I just have an education but I'm the same as you I do I'm human too I make mistakes. So it's okay for me to apologize. It's okay for me to admit my wrongs in this classroom. And it's just when they know that they're in a warm, safe environment 
and they trust you, that's when the learning happens. Um, and that's when they they're wanting to learn. And then you you even sometimes if you don't hear it right then in the class to another teacher in another classroom, that kid start defending you when negative things are said or heard about mm-hmm. you. It's just showing them that you're human. I wanted to go back to something that Ms. Sanders said also about understanding culture. Um, even when you said like the calling out is cultural. I mean, that hit me because mm-hmm. like I said, going to um, predominantly white schools, I mean, I felt very misunderstood because <laughs> I mean, really, when you said that, that was the first time where I was like, man, so, wow, like, I was just kind of out of place, you know? People didn't know how to handle the fact that I just was ready to go with my answer, Um, and it got me in trouble a lot, Um, but it is, it's just understanding the differences and the fact that it's okay. Like, my classroom was rarely a, like, sit, don't move, and, like, you know, like, that's not who our kids are, and that's okay, and I think when we are able to prioritize that on campuses as well and make that okay, um, then it also makes our students feel a lot more safe because I know that that's definitely what I struggle with in my education. Um, and it does, it makes you feel misunderstood um, mm-hmm. and like you don't have a voice. I also think that um, with the schools, some schools, they say that 80% of the teachers are make up the white population, white teachers, 80% are in the, in the school system. But I feel as though a lot of the students and the type of students are entering, economically disadvantaged students are entering the school system, but they're not changing the type of teachers that are able to relate to those students, which can cause a lot of confusion as well. And if they're not trying to understand and build those relationships and learn, you know, different things about different cultures, I think that's where we will continue to perpetuate the stereotype if nothing is done. If we don't have that sensitivity training, the unbiased training for the teachers to understand, I love the fact that you guys took that bus ride through the neighborhood was just wonderful. Um, So I think if we don't have these conversations and have these PDs, I think change will be harder to come by in the classrooms if I think administration don't implement these things right away. Oh, that was the other thing that I was going to say, like along with what you're saying is I think understanding too that some of even the relate the relationship piece and all Mm -hmm. that, I feel like our students, like black students need it on a different level like I feel like that is a a part of just how we interact as a people um and so I think sometimes it's also something that people really don't think is as important because like I mean the white schools that I went to that was not a thing Mm -hmm. um it really wasn't like as long as I mean and I had teachers that I enjoyed that that um poured into me but it was a very different type of relationship. I don't feel like, um, like I, I went to black schools for my preschool years and it was very relational, very um, mm-hmm. like, and everything else. And you felt that. Um, but when I entered um, private schools, I didn't, I didn't feel it in the same way. You didn't um, have that connection. And, like as far as just across the board. The connection it just didn't seem like it was as needed or as like important i don't know if that makes sense but. that makes sense uh to me this is tanya again i uh want to share on um, two folks so one school that i had uh, if you know anything about houston broadway square my school was right over there lewis elementary and uh i love lewis i uh, went there in the midst of the move we were getting a new school built and uh, HSB had put us up in all portable. Now imagine 1,000 students in portable buildings. Uh, it, it was a hot mess, but we made the best of it uh, until the new building uh, was, was, was done. But what I can share during that time, I um, was able to hire uh, a lot of my students were Teach for America uh, uh, teachers coming in. Mm-hmm. And uh, so every Saturday, we had Saturday school over there because when I got to the school, we were forced from the bottom. 
you know, in test scores for HISD. So, uh, and when you go to those meetings, it's, it is, she's right, it is about the score to get into those homes, which my kids went Broadway Square, to get those parents to trust us, to send them so that we can start a magnet program, you know, because our kids needed, uh, again, to be able to put their talents on display. We started a, a cheer club. We, I got a music teacher to start, you know, a music class uh, there. Uh, so the kids can show, display their talents and their gifts and things. And that's how I was able to pull them in with building those relationships. Some of the best teachers that I had were the ones who were not afraid to walk through Broadway Square and knock them to high. You know, we're starting up this uh, Saturday school program. Yes, we're going to give rewards and prizes, but we need your child to be there each Saturday from 8 a.m. to 12, and we're going to feed them breakfast, and we're going to feed them lunch. Can you let us have your child to come? You know, and again, once they learned us, all I had to do from after that was make phone calls. Yeah, we're doing this again on Saturday. I look for, I need all my, you know, first, I'm um, doing uh, first through third this weekend. Next weekend's going to be fourth and fifth. I need them there in the school. They knew they could trust us. They knew we'd be responsible for their kids. We would even have to walk them back. Again, this is all culture. They need to know they can trust you first as for parents. Secondly, the most beautiful thing that came out of that it wasn't all my African-American and Hispanic teachers that were teaching. My white mm -hmm. teachers would come knock on doors too, mm -hmm. you know. And so they would come and uh, knock on doors, but they had to show as a community, we're not afraid of what we get, we have to deal with here. And But we want you to know that we love your kids. We care about your kids. You can trust us with your kids. So once we began that, those kinds of things, the school soared. The school mm -hmm. saw it. And I can't say it was all because of, you know, one person doing one thing. It was a collective thing with everybody working together. Now, what I can say is my love kind of funny because of the young lady that was saying she went to private school. My daughter's in private school. And, and so she, uh, she uh, comes across naive sometimes to a lot of things that you know when we go to my school and it's like she said well why did they do that mom why did they do that uh, and it's just it's funny it's it's our little joke so i do understand from both sides where, where she's coming from that culturally you know when she got into the predominantly african-american schools as an educator it was a bit different for her i believe that's what she said was that right she said yes Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I get it. I, I totally get it. But it takes everybody working together for that success to grow. Mm -hmm. So without closing, so um, what I heard um, is that in order to reach some teachers who are not as connected, we should have more PD sensitivity training. What other things you think should be implemented like today? So when we go back to school in August, we're going to get the ball rolling, especially with the um, worldwide movement with George Floyd, because tensions are very high at this point. It's got to be addressed. Yes. It's got to be addressed from day one, before day mm -hmm. one with the educators, before the kids step on campus, yep. it's got to be addressed. It's got to be talked about. We got to share. We got to communicate what our feelings are, how, and then how we can make it better for our kids and it's got to be the thinking has got to uh, swiftly change to our kids the very first time they say oh you got tyrone in your room this year and you see oh my god oh my uh-uh call it out it's got to mm -hmm. be called out i don't care who does it i don't care if they're black i don't care if they're white hispanic whoever call it out if you can't teach tyrone just like the young lady said okay i'll take it but this may not be the place for you because mm -hmm. i got a lot of tyrones in this school you mm -hmm. see, that's my opinion. Okay. Anybody else? I agree. I think that going back, like she, uh, Ms. Sanders said, that as an adult, um, we all are looking at the same television. We all see what's going on around mm -hmm. us. We have to address it among how we all feel. So mm -hmm. maybe that all of us sitting in a circle, uh, mm -hmm. talking about it and then that way you will have a clear understanding of this is how we feel and as an adult how imagine then putting your shoes and how do you 
children are feeling mm -hmm. because they are they it's opinions all around them and they hearing the negative and the positive that are coming out of this so then you have to just imagine yourself in their shoes and then what can we do in our classroom and that might even be teamwork i'm having a different opinion this teacher having a different opinion that may be something the kids may need to see, but it's addressed on a professional, uh, respective letter. I mean, level that you're respecting each other, but you are, you're showing them how to address the issues the proper way. Because sometimes right. they may not know, and right. it comes out as anger. But it's always a different way to address the issues. Right. But I think training. Um, is going to be key. Training these teachers, these PDs, I think also role playing. You have a, a student that you can't relate to, you don't know how to deal with. I think we need role playing that goes into place as well. And that sensitivity uh, training is going to be key. Because I even feel it could have been something totally different. When I started at my current school, I wasn't sure if I was being treated a certain way because of my color, my skin, or was it because of my room and you know jealousy? I, I didn't know where it was coming from. So I wonder if there are students who even feel that way. Um, I just think that we need to have that the sensitivity training. And I kind of brought that up. We need sensitivity training at this school because how I felt how I was treated was unfair. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna go. Hey, ahead. come on back home, honey. Come on back home. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't leave me. Don't leave me by myself. But, um, I'm gonna definitely agree with you on that point, Joy, because I saw how you were being treated last year and it upset my spirit. And mm -hmm. I started preaching to certain folks that I know was gonna go back and talk to the principals and be like, hey, this happened to my girl. I need to talk to you about this because this is this ain't right and blah blah this and blah blah that. Um, and I just think people are just so, so caught up in their own world, they don't take the time to see that the things they're doing to others is affecting them in a negative way. That is not excuse behavior by any means, but excuse me, I just really believe that, you know, given the state of America, you can definitely see that because we have such a Individualist, individualistic society, we focus on ourselves and you know how we feel and our beliefs and things of that nature. Yep. It's very hard for us to take a step back yep. and think about other people and how our actions affect others. And I think mm -hmm. as teachers, we expect, we're expected to be able to do that. We got to realize that we are people too, and there are times when we can't see the forest through the trees, but the trees are people. So to speak. Um, and I think that especially if you happen to be at um, a school where the majority of the staff is predominantly white, um, but you have a high minority population at that school, you have to have these conversations because it is impossible to teach children of color and not recognize your own biases. So I know like um, one of the most telling things for me was um, in, um, one of the graduate programs I attended where we went through bias training and I saw my own biases that I had for my own people. Like I'm feeling like, oh yeah, I'm power to the people. Yeah, I always got you. No, that ain't the case, honey, because there's been some times when I got into an elevator and I held my pocketbook a little bit closer because a male of color got into the elevator with me. So I had to admit that about myself, you know, and I think that sometimes we have to do that introspective review and bring that to the forefront and understand okay we are people too i have these own biases myself and if we have the open dialogue we can talk about it and yeah. yes it may be uncomfortable but it's needed right. right because that's how change happens change only happens when when it's uncomfortable because if it's all comfortable and everything is all hunky-dory ain't no change ever going on well, that in, in I haven't seen my students in April or May, and it was all online. And then uh, Mr. Floyd had his 
terrible accident with police where they murdered him. And I, I didn't know what to do as a white guy. So I emailed all my minority students and said, I went, and I was vulnerable and said, hey, I don't know what to say. I don't know what you're going through, but let me, if there's something I can do, let me know. If you don't want to do this assignment, we'll do it next week. Let's talk about it. And you were saying, uh, so one of you was saying, making, making connections and being vulnerable and apologizing. And I think that each one of them wrote me an email back, oh, Mr. Kernahan, you're so nice. Thank you so much. But it was just, for whatever reason, I felt comfortable enough opening up and saying, hey, I don't know. I'm just a guy. I don't know. I'm here to teach you physics, but that's not important right now. <laughs> Other things are more important. Let's talk about it. And, and it, was, it was really great uh, for, for me. Uh, and they eventually got all the work done and they're fine. <laughs> There's other things to worry about though. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think they probably appreciated mm -hmm. that in that moment you could be real and not just blinded by, you say you teach physics, yeah. you weren't just saying, okay, we gotta keep going with physics, gotta keep going. No, this is a tra travesty. What do we do? What can I say? You know, they appreciate that real moment. So how do we get other people to, to reach out? How do we get more people like me to, to do that? It's going to take more people like you talking about it. Mm -hmm. It's going to take you and more people uh, starting conversations just like this one. You know, uh, I don't know, you do a wine and cheese and invite people over. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. And talk mm -hmm. about it. What are your thoughts about it? You know, how do you, and you, hey, you know, Joy and I, and I uh, sound like the other ladies are down as well. I mean, but it takes more communities coming together and talking about it mm -hmm. in real ways and seeing how people are feeling about it. You know, uh, I've, we, we all have friends that, uh, who don't look like us, but are saying just like you, what can I do? Well, I never knew this was, you know, happening, what happened this way. And so we appreciate these types of conversations, but they got to become more. They got to come more. So I also think um, part of the solution um, will take um, you having those conversations with other people and educating them. So you get the education. We have to keep um, the momentum going. We can't stop, we can't stop. We have this worldwide movement that has occurred, but we have to keep going. We have to keep having those conversations. And sadly, sometimes they don't wanna hear those conversations from us. Sometimes they wanna hear from another white person. They, they hear it. I just finished the book, Black Like Me, and um, the white journalist, he um, took a pill to turn his skin white. And he wanted to live and experience that whole black experience as a black man. And he said, there was a black professor who said the same exact thing uh, that he said, but no one said anything to him. They didn't listen. But as soon as the white man said the same thing, he got a standing ovation. So sometimes it's gonna take more conversation <laughs> um, to continue to happen and just keep the momentum going. So you got a whole bunch of background and information tonight. It's gonna to take you, all of us, but it's gonna take you to keep the conversations going. Just like when my friend, my white friend, I said, it's your responsibility to check that teacher. She probably won't hear from me. She's gonna see the angry black lady. She needs to hear it from you. And then of course, when she responded in a very educational way, she was reprimanded to, I say, shame on her principal because it, there was no um, subjective opinion or anger or anything in her response, but she just educated. So with her principal, is she's part of the problem because she wants us to be quiet. And if we continue to be quiet, change will never come. And I also want to say that it's, you're starting the conversation but we also have to you have to also know that it's people that are willing to still like we're here to talk about it with you to help you because i know sometimes when you start a conversation and when other people like of a black woman and you start like other black people start you start kind of like seeing their view and taking on their mm -hmm. opinion 
I think just having, knowing that, hey, there's people that are standing behind me. There's people who are willing to help me. Um, And we're also, too, at this moment, we're letting our guards down Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they do understand. It's not just not understanding where we're coming from as an adult, but also understanding where our kids coming from. So I think at those moments when those conversations are happening, all gloves just got to fall. All defensive just got to fall. And everybody not just talk, but we have to listen to Mm -hmm. everybody's fears and hopes and dreams. So we have to become listeners, white and black and Hispanic, everybody. And I think, but TQ, you said about... uh, being honest about your own biases. I think when we also are able to be that vulnerable, it helps other people feel more, um, like less threatened having the conversation. Um, So for instance, like I know when I shared a lot of my experiences um, online about how I actually felt going through uh, my private school experience, like literally this one experience where I, a a classmate was so excited for me to come to her house, told me all day, we're having a volleyball party. I got there and she told me it was someone she wanted me to meet. And she brings me into the house. And the first person she introduces me to is the only other black woman there, her 80 year old maid. And she tells me how she all, like she also took care of her dad, his, her, his, uh, her dad when he was a kid and things like that. Just like a lot of experiences that I feel like other people probably wouldn't remember. But from my perspective, being oftentimes the only black person there, um, I think it led to a lot of people reaching out to me and not realizing that I had those experiences. And then, but also being able to have the conversation not from a place of anger from my from my stance, but of also understanding that it is frustrating when you've lived your life one way and you thought everything was fine and now you're starting to see all these things that you completely missed. Like, how did I miss that? How did I not know that was going on? Um, and even when people are trying to understand the concept of white privilege, like, you're trying, you're, are you saying then that I didn't work hard or I didn't, ex- no, it's not that, you know, it's understanding we all have privileges in one form or another, right? My education was a privilege, but, you know, the color of your skin gives you privileges that I don't have um, and I can never have. Um, so, but being vulnerable and having those conversations and not just speaking from a place of like, People should know this. They should know X, Y, and Z. Our neighborhoods are so segregated that you could live your whole life and not interact with people from a lot of different races. So we can't be shocked that people are sometimes have no idea about what's going on with us. Yeah, yeah. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Do you have any last things that you want to say? Anything you want to say before we close out? This has been such a wonderful conversation and I think it's needed. We need to have more of these conversations. The momentum needs to keep going because I strongly feel as though our children of our future, um, we have a responsibility to them. And if we see something that's not quite right, it's our responsibility to speak up because we are there to protect our children as well as educate them. And so if we don't try to snuff, you know, um, these racial problems, snuff them out, we, we're going to continue to have, we need to call these people out. We need, just like Ms. Santa said, just call them out right there. You know, we got to keep, we got to, you got to, you got to say something. So that's why I say shame on that principal for telling my, my friend to be quiet. <laughs> Don't say anything. But like I said before, sometimes social media and the policies that they have in place, it will um, paralyze people into not speaking because is that another way of controlling us? Of course, you don't want that extreme hate or you're you're being fair. Why you can't speak up for what's right? And um, I, I think a lot of people are afraid to speak up as well. 
So I do appreciate all of you um, for coming on here today and sharing your thoughts, your feelings, your passion, and it did bleed through um, when you spoke. We as educators, whether you are still in the classroom or left the classroom, we all get it, become teachers because we truly have a love for children and we really believe that children are the future and we have a good understanding of the importance of having really great teachers in the classroom and how uh, pivotal a good teacher can be in a child's life. And it's, it is ultimately my hope that all educators, you know, enter the classroom every year with high hopes for their kid students. And even though we may make mistakes along the way, I, it is really my hope that people do still have their hearts in the right place, you know? Um, now, I can't speak for every educator, but the ones that I have been exposed to at my current school and past schools, like they actually are, they're good people. Now, sometimes they make mistakes, right? Heck, I make mistakes. But I, I do believe that their heart is in the right place. They really do the passion about educating students and trying to do the right thing. All right, guys, thank you for coming out tonight. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>